What is up, YouTube? This is Red Leprechaun Gaming, and welcome back to He Who Fights with Monsters, Book One. We're on Chapter One Hundred, Legwork. Danielle Geller and Talia Mercer looked at the water pouring out of the astral space aperture. It was within a crevice in a rocky outcropping, but but was itself a free-floating circle of shimmering blue. The water streamed out of the aperture, the source of a small creek they were currently standing in. It wasn't the overwhelming torrent some apertures had, which is why they had chosen this particular one. There wasn't so much force that people couldn't push their way against the water to enter. The other reason being that the first two apertures they tried had already failed and vanished. You've been in this astral space before, haven't you? Daniel asked. The last monster surge, Thalia said. Monsters were spawning out of an aperture in the desert, so we set up a defense point inside. The advantage of having your seat of power in the city, Daniel said. I spent the whole time defending my estate. Danielle turned back to look at the expedition arrayed out behind her. The order of entry had already been organized, with the Silver Rankers heading through first to scout and deal with any immediate trouble. She then turned back, took a deep breath, and pushed herself through the water, streaming out. She emerged underwater, disoriented, spreading out her senses to get a grasp of her surroundings. Finding a sandy bottom, she kicked off of it to push herself up, breaching the surface of the water was not very deep. As she swam away from the submerged aperture in the water, Danielle took a look at her surroundings. She was, on a turquoise, she was in a turquoise lagoon under a clear cerulean sky. The lagoon was mostly bounded by rocky rises with scrubbly trees growing up the sides but she spotted a small sandy beach behind it were trees and tropical plants. Thalia emerged from the aperture likewise, quickly surfacing. Nice, Thalia said, swimming away from the aperture to give the next person space. It'll be good to explore instead of just staying near the aperture fighting monsters. Clive entered the office of the Magic Society director as normal. The director was absent, while the deputy director, Parshard Finn, was at work behind his own desk. Parshard rarely glanced up at barely glanced up at the intrusion, continuing to write as he spoke. What is it, Standish? I don't have a lot of time with all these people off on the expedition. I'm aware, sir, Clive said. I've been very busy myself, but I've managed to get things reorganized, so I'd like to take some time on another project. As you know, I have an Adventure Society membership. Yes, I heard about the Marsh Hydra, Pushard said. I can't imagine your contribution was all that much, but well, well done. There's an open contract with the Adventure Society, Clive said. A friend and I want to crack at it. Pichard paused his writing to look up at Clive. You want to slack off so you can go to social events and hope the thief shows up. Actually, sir, we're going to take a different approach, something that will hopefully have more success. Who is this friend of yours? Another iron ranker, Jason Asano. The one who handled the lumber mill affair, Pichard mused, thought mused thoughtfully. You know him. I like to keep apprised of goings on, Pichard said. You're sure your duties will be covered? I won't be completely absent, sir. I'll be checking in each day to make sure everything is running smoothly. Then take what time you need, so long as you feel the chances of your success are reliable. Really? Clive asked. Pichard returned back to his work. Learn to take yes for an answer, Standish. Clive called Jason in his lodgings. Jason had papers scattered over the refreshment table, picking up some to read from the comfort of a lounge chair. How did it go? Jason asked. Surprisingly well, Clive said, registering his surprise. He nodded at all, the at all the papers. What's that? A copy of the contract of service between the Adventure Society and the city of Greenstone. If the Duke of Greenstone and the Adventure Society director are playing some kind of game with this thief as the central piece, I thought I should at least get a look at the board. And, Clive said, sitting down, it's possible this whole thing is about trying to get the Duke to violate the terms of the agreement. It gives local authorities a lot of influence in the Adventure Society society affairs, it would make sense, given Els Bissarella's driving goal was to eliminate that influence. I'm inclined to think it's not, though. Why not? The agreement is up for re renegotiation in a couple years, and the director doesn't strike me as an impatient person. If she were to violate the terms herself, trying to provoke the Duke, he could appeal to the core branches of the Adventure Society, maybe even get Gitarella replaced. Given her proclivities as, are a direct threat to aristocratic power, having almost anyone else in her seat when negotiations come up is a win for him. I don't think she's willing to take that risk when all she has to do is wait for her chance to renegotiate. Then what's it all about? I'm not sure, Jason said. 
there's some third factor beyond the Duke and Arella's basic agendas. Arella wants something, and she's willing to push the pounds to get it. How does that affect us? We're just trying to catch the thief. That's the knife. It's you don't. It's the knife you don't see that stabs you, Clive. What's next then? We turn off the filter, punch one off the p pinch one off in the pool, and see who comes to clean up the mess. What? We catch the thief and see who tries to stop us. What if they do stop us? Have some self confidence, man. Jason stared at started gathering the pages. There are a few interesting things in the agreement. Jason said as he put them down in a leather folder. The Adventure Society has quite a lot of say in civic affairs when it involves a society contract. Interestingly, it puts that power with the individual adventurer executing the contract rather than the society itself. What does that matter? The loosened adventurer standards have allowed more or less the entire arist aristocracy to be nominal members of the Adventure Society. So decentralizing power is another means of the aristocracy to circumvent the authority of the Adventure Society's higher officials. I'm starting to understand what Arella is up against now. It's something worth knowing, another trick to have up the sleeve. What now, then? Clive asked. I know we won't be randomly attending social events hoping they get robbed. People have been trying that for months, and it hasn't worked. Then what do you think should be first? the first step? Figure out what they're doing and how. I was thinking the same thing, Jason said. We need to talk to all of the victims, learn as much about what was taken and the thief's methodology as we can. Are these people going to talk to us? Jason chuckled. These people are used to having the power, not being the victim, and there isn't anything they can do about it. Don't underestimate how much that will eat at them. They know the Adventure Society isn't letting anyone other than Iron Rankers in on this, so a three-star is the best they can hope for. Add an assist from the Magic Society, and it will seem like a ray of hope. They'll cooperate, and if they don't, we'll talk them into it. You say that like it's going to be easy. Jason and Clive left the townhouse of Lord Verdis and started heading towards the closest line, loop line transit station. Lord Vordis was a minor noble, but one well known for making useful connections between the upper and lower echelons of society. Are you sure you should have done that? Clive asked, glancing back nervously. Done what? Jason asked innocently. Told him the Mercers sent you. I didn't do that. I was there. But were you really listening? I never said the Mercers sent me. Yes, the conversation happened to go in a certain, in such a way that certain connections between myself and the Mercer family came to light, and I suppose I can see how that particular topic of conversation in proximity to other topics may have led some people to assume the Mercers sent me, but I made no such assertion. I'm not responsible for other people's assumptions, Clive. It really seems like you are. I don't know what we're... I mean, we got what we're going after, that's the important thing. I can't believe he told you he was smuggling sump coil rods, Clive said. They're restricted by the Adventure Society and the Magic Society, but he told an adventurer and a Magic Society official. Luckily, this town's so corrupt, Jason said, he figured there wouldn't be any major repercussions. Because he thought the Mercer family sent you. I told you, I'm not responsible for the assumptions of others. What are sump coil rods, anyways? They're used to create very small areas that are invisible to magical senses, Clive said. Auras, tracking abilities, seeking rituals, nothing short of gold rank rituals or abilities stands a chance. Very small spaces, though, about the size of a laundry basket. What are they used for? The big things about them is they don't trip warnings. A lot of detection magic, be that abilities, rituals, or items, give back a negative reading if they hit a zone they can't penetrate. Use some coil rods the right way, and most things won't even register the negative space. You think they they took them to create a hideout they can't be traced to? Jason asked. Use a bunch of those rods to stack the spaces? That wouldn't be practical. They don't ma make enough. They didn't take enough of the rods. Well, we just keep collecting puzzle pieces. Jason said. Eventually, we'll have enough to figure out the picture. Jason and Clive were in Jason's lodgings, poring over notes. Jason's were scattered over the refreshments table in the area in the lounge area, while Clive laid claim to the dining table. More than a week into their investigation, Jason's lodgings were so deep in notes, maps, lists, and magical tool design documents that Madame Laundry refused to have her staff clean around it. You just tell me when you're done and I'll send my people in, she told Jason. Just don't leave it too long or I'll send people in anyway. In almost three months, the thief had done 17 jobs. Every day, Jason and Clive would go from victim to victim, scene to scene, gathering information. 
They're basically doing two kinds of jobs, Jason mused. The first type is public, usually some kind of snatch and grab of valuables. These jobs are in open places with plenty of escape routes. The loot is frankly not worth the risk. It ends up it en tends to be highly specific, which would make for fencing tricky. Make fencing it tricky. A lot of adventurers have been taking that angle, Clive said. The Magic Society has sold a lot of appraisal tools in the last five months. The other type of job tends to be a specialized magic equipment, rare, valuable, sometimes restricted. They've taken much bigger risks for these jobs as well. Every time they've come close to being caught, it's been on this type of job. Whoever this thief is, Clive said, they're either, they either have an interesting understanding of magical tools, or are working with someone who does. Aura masking, material deconstruction, bypassing mechanical protections, her methods speak to an eclectic magical knowledge, most likely specialized for this kind of work. A professional thief, Jason said. That's hardly a surprise at this point. I'd love to meet them. Their unorthodox approach to magic study would be fascinating to discuss. Well, the whole point of this is so you can do exactly that, Jason said, sorting through the piles of paper in front of him. He frowned, looking at them all. There's a lot of paper in this city for a place with such a small lumber industry. That's all reed paper. There's a local reed that grows pro prolifically in the Delta, Clive explained absently, not looking up from his own notes. It's a fairly easy process to produce paper from it. Pulp it, a little bit of magic, and there you go. It's one of the local exports. Reed paper, Jason said, running a sheet between his fingers. I wouldn't have guessed. This is high-quality stuff. Clive started reorganizing all the papers in front of him. Some he placed into a neat order on the table. Others he stacked in haphazard piles on the chairs around it. The snatching grabs obviously some kind of distraction from their true purpose, he reasoned. Agreed, Jason said. Clearly their true intention is all these magical supplies they're taking on the other jobs. If I can figure out what all of it is for, then maybe we can figure out their ultimate objective, he stood up, rubbing his temples. I need a break to clear my head. Jason glanced at the clock on the wall, like everything in Madame Laundry's Inn, it was tasteful, un understated in design, and worked perfectly. It's almost time we headed out anyways, Jason said. There's something that should be worth seeing. Is it something to do with the mysterious group taking over the expedition to explore the complex we found, Clive asked? Word came down from on high to let them take over, which didn't impress Lucian Lamprey. Who? Jason asked. Oh, the director of the Magic Society. Hadn't had the pleasure yet. Pleasure isn't the word I would describe use isn't the word I'd use. Still it is gratifying to see it taking off of him the way it was taken off me. Well, you can meet the man who took it off him, Jason said. He's scheduled to arrive this afternoon. And that's the end of chapter one hundred. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then have fun guys.